Hello, I'm Melody Pash, Dream Diva, and we're here to explore the messages in your dreams and how they affect your everyday life. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today on Dream Diva, we're going to be addressing the general topic of sexual elements in your dreams. Okay? So sometimes these are going to be directing or showing issues like shame or areas of abuse, fear of abuse, fear of victimization, fear of being violated or having someone overlord or or abuse you in some way, whether that be mental, spiritually, physically, verbally, whatever, whatever that abuse is, that will show up sometimes in your dreams as a sexual element. Now some of those elements might be as simple as you're found kissing someone. It could be someone you know, someone you don't know, it might be someone that's close to you, it might be someone completely unidentified, they don't even have a face. That does happen. Then there are dreams where you are literally making out, others where you're having uh, literal intercourse, others where maybe someone is fondling you or abusing, taking advantage. That would be like taking advantage of you uh, without your without your consent. Sometimes erotic positioning, it's going to be the same thing. Um, and often you will have... Um, there will be times when you just have repetitive drive for orgasms or you wake with a, an orgasm. You can't control what happened in your dream. Your body did what it did and you have questions about that. So those things are going to be connected to areas in the spirit that are seductions. They're seducing or attempting to seduce a spiritual portion or area aspect of you where your true DNA is, where your God-given DNA and your um, your rightful uh, destiny or your call is, right? So the enemy opposition is always trying to shut that down so that you can't ever fulfill exactly who you were called to be because if you do then you're going to cause him trouble so that's why we want to be careful to be listening to these types of dreams so I caught up recently with my friend Lori in Kansas City who is an excellent certified Splunkna practitioner and counselor now if you get with her she can explain the Splunkna um, method to you when you talk to her. But let's talk to her about some of the sexual dreams and about some things that come out of your dreams. She works with a lot of satanic ritual abuse victims and dissociation victims. So this should be a very interesting interview. Let's get with her, see what she has to say. So hello everybody. I want to welcome you to this episode of Dream Diva. And I have a really incredible friend with me named Lori um, Morris Gadu. And she and I have been friends for a long time. She is in Kansas City. We're in Kansas City today. You might see that on my shirt. Yeah. Modality. I know that you're very prophetic, so you have an intuitive gift that you work with and you connect with creator in different ways uh looking for what's going on and you engage your your um clientele mm -hmm. with that um tell me sort of where your basis is and sort of what you work out of because we all do it differently mm -hmm. so you're more biblically based right mm -hmm. in yes. in sort of your all of your modality and in the way you work so you might give me just a short um blip on on how that works for you yeah if somebody says that they're stuck in a place and they can't seem to get a different mindset or feel free from something a particular like a sexual addiction or tormenting playbacks of the past you know even could have PTSD I have them fill out a questionnaire that gives me history on their family of origin oh, because the family imprint 
is very important to us, not just the individual events of trauma, but what our imprint was living in the home. If we were a latchkey kid and then had trauma, it's going to impact us differently than if we had a wow. healthy, loving home. Because your identity is formed in the continuity of the family structure sure. and safety. Sure. If that's absent, your identity is weaker, and when you get an event-oriented trauma, it impacts you in a stronger way. There's all kinds of other factors that play in, but what I do is get okay. that history, and then I formulate questions and dialogue between me and my client to talk to God the Creator about. Because if He's the Creator, uh, if He's the Creator, He knows the answer to our questions, mm -hmm. and He'll talk to us. And I just believe that with all my heart. I've seen it with all kinds of people, every walk of life. If we ask him something, he likes to respond. And so if we can get my goal, if you will, in my time is for the person sitting in front of me to get a different perspective on their pain than they've had, either of themselves or the person that hurt them or both. And they get that from God's overarching view, mm. the creator's view okay. of life. And once they get that change of perspective, often what happens is there is a total ability to receive something different about the way they saw themselves or someone else. And they shift into a new mindset and then they practice, you know, several weeks of receiving that and partnering with that truth. And then they feel like a different person. They can live differently. They don't just feel differently. They can live differently. Right. So it's really all about finding the root of the lie and mm -hmm. whatever yes. uh, that's been affecting them. Poor belief them. systems. Mm. Yeah. Um, wrong mindsets. Um, yeah. You know, even I could sit here with you and have a different perspective on you. You might say, oh, yeah. You know, I say, you're beautiful, Mel. And you're like, thanks. And I know just how far that went in. But I'm looking at you going, God, she's gorgeous. But your mindset may not be able to go there mm. because of your past wounding. And wow. so, you know, me saying that isn't enough. But if you hear God the Creator say, mm. wow, wow, you're gorgeous, mm. it's going to mean something. And then you can receive what I have to say. Right. Wow, that's really good. And, you know, that happens for a lot of us, you know, where we, we uh, people will tell us something and we, we want to believe it. You know, we want, I want to believe, you know, that God thinks I'm beautiful or that you think I'm beautiful. But the reality is that's really hard for us sometimes. We deflect a lot. Right, we do. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what are some of the other obstacles that would come out of sexual abuse that you've come up against? Um, blockages in communication with hearing, you know, God talk to them. Okay. Um, sometimes uh, coping mechanisms like cutting themselves, causing oh, okay. pain, overeating, oh. um, overspending. Mm. Some of the biggest ones I see are self-harm, self-hatred, and overeating. Those are the most common in the world that I've lived in wow. with the clients I've had. Um, it also often projects into sh very shame-based looking. I'm the one who's bad. I, there's something wrong mm -hmm. with me. I'm mm -hmm. at fault. And so very, um, like I described myself earlier, apologizing a lot, not being able to set boundaries, not being able to speak up for yourself. Oh, wow. Uh, so loss that, of a voice. Loss of a mm -hmm. voice. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really good. Yeah, I I have known you for a long time, and, and you know, you've – Send me a couple of dreams that your um, clientele had, and it was interesting going through some of that, sort of looking at what was going on. Do you have a lot of situations where uh, things will come up there where you feel like creators speaking in dreams or, or in a place of more their subconscious level where things are coming up and then and then that's sort of a clue for you in sessions yes in fact it's one of the questions I ask every okay. time I work with someone and it's more than an hour and a half if it's a couple two and a half hours or longer um for I do different types of session lengths okay and every time there's an intensive of any kind that is one of the questions what dreams have you had this week because mm. I'm expecting if you come intentionally engaging with me 
with the idea you want to look at an issue and you want it to change and there's a creator who's talking, why would he not talk about it? Right. And one of the ways he talks is with dreams. And um, I have gotten clues. Um, I've had clues about mindsets, clues about things wow. they haven't seen through dreams. I've actually had people um, recover memories they didn't have. That's wow. not very common, but I've had it happen a couple oh, of times. Oh, that's huge. I could see how that would work, though. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It started in there. I said, give yourself and your body permission to remember. If you're mm -hmm. ready, ask you know yourself and God if you're ready. And then they did, and these two different women started having dreams. Wow. Now, Incredible. you still have to choose to believe the dreams, which was sure. the next step. Okay. Yeah. So, Lori, uh, would you mind sharing some of your own experiences, if you wouldn't mind, about... Uh, some of the healing that you've been through, and I would like to sort of stay in the vein um, with some of the sexual abuse. Yeah. So we will go there. Cool. Um, I actually love working with trauma, and particularly sexual trauma, sexual brokenness um, that people have gone through, whether it's been they have been sexually abused or they've abused someone else or they've been raped or there's been voyeurism in the home. And um, so what I, my, this, I work out of my own journey and my own journey was that my late husband, uh, David Morris and I were married 21 years. We were pastors and worship leaders, traveled the world uh, teaching and speaking on worship but, and, and looked glorious to lots of people. Because uh, mm -hmm. he was a really dynamic guy, an amazing musician and man of God. But he was uh, deeply wounded from childhood sexual abuse starting at a very young age, the age of three. Wow. And it was within the church and it was not uncovered. And so he lived with um, his sexual brokenness and brought that into our marriage. And so his response to his coping for his pain and trying to um, get comfort and find his identity um, he did through acting out with homosexuality and so wow. in our marriage um, he was unfaithful multiple times and we walked restoratively through stepping down from ministry being restored to ministry we uh, did counseling with people received counseling ourselves um, so the journey is very personal um, I go over the highlights of that journey in my book shattered and then um, but honestly, now, is that a book that we can, that they can get on Amazon? Yes, okay. it is on Amazon shattered. And then by okay. Lori Morris, um, that overviews a lot more than just our story, but our entire family story and journey and the things the Holy Spirit taught me in that place. So I minister out of a place of my own healing journey and having to walk through difficult places and forgiveness. And how do you restore trust when you've been betrayed like that? And um, how do you get to the core root system that's driving the behaviors? Because mm -hmm. different people act on in different ways. Mm -hmm. Some it's with promiscuity. Some it's with sexual addictions to porn or pornographic type literature. Some it's to masturbation. Some it's to being licentious or loose with other people. Um, and just the, the thrill of overcoming or defeating, you know, someone, um, there's all kinds of ways. Mm. It's and, so. and this sort of brings me up to the other question I was going to ask, which I guess you could address that uh, maybe on your late husband's behalf. But what those broken pieces, those fragmentations mm -hmm. look like <laughs> so that people might might uh, yeah. discover and, and be able to, you know, uh, acknowledge their own broken pieces. Yep. That's a great question. It's loaded. I hope I can do I know. it. <laughs> well, <laughs> give so, us the give us so the bottom line. David's um, brokenness was extreme because of the mm. amount of trauma, and it was multiple times that he was assaulted by a male yeah. because of um, the the length of time that he kept it a secret. His wow. brokenness wasn't just acting out homosexually, but he actually shattered into a bunch of parts, um, was clinically diagnosed with a, a disorder called dissociative identity disorder. Okay, okay. And so he created different personalities to cope with his mm, pain. Mm -hmm. That was also part of our healing journey and uh, a unique one being in the ministry and dealing with that, right. finding out it wasn't a demon. And um, that Right. It, so in the, sorry, but in the middle of this, you guys are 
you're actually involved, not only engaged, but you're involved in leadership in the mm -hmm. traditional church. Yes, yes, okay. that is correct. Wow. wow. And we had amazing leaders who walked with us. This wouldn't have been possible just because we were willing to look at our stuff or because we were um, being active. This was because of the people who surround us, who had been mm. in relationship with us for years. Right. And they were kind, they were supportive, they may not have understood always, but they were willing to walk with us until we got to the root. And I keep saying the root, um, to me, our emotional trauma has a root bed system. Okay. And so we have behaviors out here in the present that are related to old traumas back here that we may mm -hmm. not connect because mm -hmm. the, the trauma looks different than our trauma now. Got but it. if the emotional content is the same, if I felt uh, shame back here as a child and now I'm feeling shamed here in the present, but it's for a totally different reason. This was sexual abuse and this is just an embarrassing moment I can have the same emotional response and be triggered by that trigger by that trigger. And wow. so um, learning to other people's brokenness, some people's is not that extreme. In fact, I speak on and encourage lay people on understanding dissociation. The, the mechanism of dissociation is a brain mechanism to survive trauma. Sure. And it is not just a mental ascent. The brain is so beautifully made by God that it can, um, literally create something that feels like reality that mm. isn't really there. Wow. And it's not hallucinatory. Um, it's not like in the context of schizophrenia. It's very much just, I'm going to make my world safe. So I'm going to go mm. somewhere else and be some, or be somebody else, or I'm going to lock down my pain. I dissociated very well in my journey when my dad suddenly died and I was 12 years old and mm. he was 38 wow. and we weren't allowed to grieve. And my dissociation wow. looked like this lid that I just shut down all my emotions sure. and with it, my memories. Oh my so goodness. my memories were very surface, like mm. this is what we did in the summer and this is what it looked like, but nothing specific stayed. And you couldn't go into any deep detail. Nope. And I couldn't connect emotionally. And that, that lasted 25 years. Oh my gosh. So dissociation is this amazing uh, system God put in our bodies to cover or not cover. It's not the word I want to cope but with trauma, cope. Yeah. to cope with trauma and process right. it. But he never intends for us to live there. Right. The rest so of it's, our but it's not a bad thing. No, it is, it is what he has given us yep. so that we can learn to cope and then we can engage with kind of what the situation is and then get, obviously get some healing, healing. and move on. The idea is that according to Colossians in the Bible, there's, um, places that God wants us to be whole in him. And so if, if we're created to be whole, and we're fractured or ba stuff is buried, that's mm -hmm. really not living out of our whole self. Right. And um, my belief is you want to live out of your whole self. You right. want to uh, live out of who you were created to be. And if I have compartmentalized these places, mm -hmm. um, well, I'll look at everything but this, or these two things can't be looked at. You know, that was too painful. Um, I'm not really living out of everything that mm -hmm. I was created to be because... I believe that we um, we learn and grow and get healed from those hard, hard places, and they make us compassionate people. They make us um, empathetic. Um, they right. they give us patience with others. Um, I noticed that on your site mm -hmm. there is a statement uh, that is very intriguing, which is "Out of our brokenness springs hope and new life." So I'm wondering. Um, in that place where we sort of compare ourselves to everybody else, we look at everybody else and say, oh, well, she has everything. I can look at Laurie and say, oh, she has everything together, right? Of course, you've been through lots of work and lots of healing. Mm -hmm. But I can look in the mirror and say, well, I'm a complete mess, and I don't want anybody to see that mess. And I would not believe. So what, what is what might be the root that would be connected to, I don't believe that anything in me could could uh, foster or cultivate some good mm -hmm. outcome. Does that make yes, sense? Yes, yes. And it's shame. Shame is talking. Okay. Shame is at the core of everyone. And I lived there for years, even though um, I was a good person and the good girl. And I tried to do everything right that I thought would bless other people and, mm. and make them happy. Um, I still felt inherently like there was something wrong with me. And I did everything I could to hide that through 
performance, through working really hard, uh, but I never felt completely known or accepted by others. It took me a wow. lot of years. In fact, my husband had passed on by the time I started looking at this in my mid-40s. Um, and I was so afraid to see the shame. Shame says there's something wrong with me. Shame says I'm different. Shame okay. says I'm not worthy. Shame says, that's why I knew immediately what was your question. It's easy. Shame um, is just there. It's in every culture. I've traveled the world and um, it's there in different cultures, even more prolifically, um, really strongly in some of the Asian cultures. Um, but it, it just says, I have to prove I'm okay. I can't just be. I can't just be who I am because that could be rejected. Right. And if you don't believe that you're okay, then why would you want someone to see the fullness of who you are? Yes. Because then they see that brokenness and that place of transparency. Well, that's a vulnerable place. It is. And that's a scary it leads place. to fear. Scary. Mm. Scary is the word. And I... I know from personal experience that my shame kept me living in fear to the point I would go and check in on people if their face looked funny at me that day that I'd seen all week long, but suddenly they, you know, and I think it's me, I've done something wrong. Oh, wow. And I would go up and go, Hey, are we okay? Is everything okay? Mm. I mean, horribly apologetic. And mm. it, you know, talk like about taking everything on yourself. Yes. Like, this would be another fractured, broken place. Okay. Now I didn't have parts, but there was this part of me I, that always was apologizing. Mm -hmm. And that's another way that our brokenness can uh, show up and demonstrate okay. itself, um, display itself. Right. And um, always apologizing, always checking in. What have I done wrong? Have I done something wrong? Are we okay? Because I was always mm -hmm. on alert because trauma puts us in this place of um, high alert and fight flight in our body and our brains. And once we've experienced trauma and it hasn't been resolved and there hasn't been healing, we kind of are waiting for the next thing. We're like this, right. you know, right. when's it going to come? What's it going to look like? Right. What does wholeness look like? Uh, you know, how do you know you have arrived there and do you ever get there? That's a great question. Isn't it? This is just my measly little perspective, but okay. um, I think that we live in wholeness when we live out of, speak out of, respond out of who we really are and not what we think we're supposed to be. And So that place of authenticity? Authenticity. Okay. And um, genuineness. Now... There are times that I, I'm a very genuine person and I'm very authentic and vulnerable, but I don't necessarily see myself as whole. But when I live from the attitude of that authenticity, it feels very whole and very real. Um, oh, wow. It's definitely not about perfection. That's I don't think awesome. we'll ever get there. And it's definitely um, not something I'm sure we arrive at. Okay. Um, I think it's a lifelong process of walking into the wholeness of the reality of mm. we are uniquely individually loved and accepted and there's nobody else like us. Mm. And there's nobody, even if they had the same gifts, even with twins and the same DNA, right. I believe there's a uniqueness to how they are seen and how they demonstrate who they are. Yeah. Wow, that is really good. Well, you know, we're in Kansas City, so if you're in Kansas City, Lori is actually here or anywhere in the area. I'm sure you could connect with her. However, you can do these, uh, her connectivity sessions with her via Skype. Via that Skype, yes. Right. Skype or and FaceTime. Or FaceTime. Remember that her uh, site is hismosaic.com, so you're going to want to check her out. Uh, Miss Lori Morris Gadu, and I'm so glad that you joined us today, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, Lori, for being with us. This has Thanks been a lot of talking. fun, and I'm glad we got to have some time together. Me too. So cool. I love you. Love you too. <laughs>